Good morning and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Dave Deacon and we're coming to you from the Tulsa State Fair. We'll have more on that later in the show, but first, Oklahoma seasons are changing and forage conditions are changing too, which means that Oklahoma producers will be monitoring the supplements that they're giving their livestock. And here's Oklahoma State's Chris Richards with some help on doing just that. When we're looking at the basic nutrition of cattle in Oklahoma, most cattle are going to be consuming a forage-based diet. Right. And over the year, the mineral content of that diet is going to be shifting. And that's relatively hard to measure and hard to predict. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do to prevent deficiencies and, and symptoms of deficiency, such as calcium deficiencies that are sudden death syndrome, magnesium deficiency with grass tetany, or even things like copper deficiency that can lead to symptoms over time, such as low reproduction rates or low immunity and health problems, mm -hmm. is that we supply those through other forms of nutrition. We can do that through supplemental feeding with cakes and cubes mm -hmm. traditionally, or more commonly year round, we recommend doing that through a free choice supplement whether that's through a, a block situation or a tub, but most frequently that's going to be through a free choice loose mineral system that we either provide in an, in an open tub that we recommend has drains in the bottom of it, or it's going to be in a covered type tub that either has a flap over the top or, or a covered roof over it to meet the nutritional needs of those animals. And, and, and as you said, the the, as the forage changes throughout the, the, the fall and winter, the mineral needs are going to change too. They are. You're dealing with a situation where the forage quality and the new minerals in the forage are changing throughout the year. That's very difficult to and expensive to measure. Mm -hmm. So you're also compounding that with the changing needs of the animals as they go through gestation, lactations, and different rates of growth. So that's one of the reasons that we recommend that you provide those year round and, and free choice. And, and you guys have a, a great tool to help producers track those changes. So one of the things once you provide that free choice is to get the actual proper amount in for the animal and making sure that they're consuming enough or not too much of that mineral. If you're not getting enough, you're in a situation where you're not meeting their needs and you may be suffering in performance. Mm -hmm. If they consume too much mineral, you can actually result in some imbalances that can create additional problems. Right. So one of the things that we've done for free choice minerals is create a simple card that you can record your mineral type. The label should have a target amount to it that tells you either a range or an amount per head per day in ounces that should be consumed of that mineral. And this card simply helps you record the date that you put your mineral out, how much you put out, and how many animals are in that pasture at that period of time. This is cards made easy enough that you can keep it up on your visor so that it's always available in your pickup when you're out putting that out. And we've also created a tool on beefextension.com that once you've filled out the mineral, you can go in and type mineral card, you can go on and type in that information. It will calculate your average mineral consumption for those animals, as well as each of the different date periods mm -hmm. will calculate, a, calculate your consumption and graph that during the periods of time. And so you can look at that change over a period of time in monitoring your measurements. And all of this is free of charge on your website. That is all free of charge on the website. Okay, thank you much, Chris. And for more information about that link, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. When the rain comes, along with the moisture, we also get a dose of refreshing rain-cooled air. What we think of less is the cooling effect of rain on soil temperatures. Wednesday gave us a good example of how rained on soil is a cooler soil. Tuesday evening, the Minko Mesonet site recorded seven-tenths of an inch of rain. South of there at Chickasha and Ninicaw, no rain was collected in the rain gauges. The peak four-inch bare soil temperatures on Wednesday afternoon showed a significant difference between the sites. Minko's high soil temperature was 79 degrees, Chickasha hit 87, and Ninicaw 85 degrees.
Another way to check on the rain cooling effect is with a graph of the 4 inch bare soil temperature. At Ninica, the soil temperature went above 80 degrees each afternoon from Saturday through Tuesday and peaked above 85 on Wednesday afternoon. Minco had a peak over 85 on Sunday afternoon and came in Tuesday and Wednesday below 80 degrees. The seven-tenths of an inch of rain at Minco provided some welcome water and cooler soil too. Here's Gary with a look at our droughty areas in Oklahoma. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, as usual, I'm going to start with the newest drought monitor report. Now, please keep in mind that this map does not reflect any rain that we received after Tuesday morning, so hopefully we've gotten some rainfall in critical areas uh, since that period. Well, as we can see, more intensification of the drought across the eastern third of Oklahoma and then over into central Oklahoma, we still have the abnormally dry conditions. That eastern third of the state into central Oklahoma, we do see moderate to severe drought, but we also have a new introduction of abnormally dry conditions out across the panhandle into northwestern Oklahoma, where that area has started to get very dry. Now, we can see these areas on the Keech Byron Drought Index map. This map shows the probability probability of wildfires based on drought and soil moisture, so it's a decent indicator of drought. You can see those red and oranges across the eastern third of the state up into central Oklahoma and also over into the northwestern corner of the state from around Buffalo out through Texas County. So there's your indication of uh, abnormally dry conditions out in the panhandle in the northwest. The October outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center for precipitation and temperatures continue to show um, increased odds of below normal precipitation across the far southeastern corner of the state and also increased odds of above normal temperatures across the entire state. So the October monthly drought outlook from the Climate Prediction Center shows where drought was uh, indicated at the time of its release over in eastern Oklahoma. That drought is expected to either persist or intensify uh, through the end of October. So that's certainly not good news. So we need to nip that uh, dry area in the northwest in the bud and we need some really good rainfall across the eastern third of the state to really start to hammer this drought out of uh, out of Oklahoma. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. The latest numbers are indicating that cattle production is up across the U.S. Daryl, how is that impacting uh, beef prices? Well, we are beginning to see beef production go up as a result of that uh, here in 2016, and we are beginning to see retail prices adjust. Uh, you know, retail beef prices actually peaked in 2015, and they're slowly working their way down. It's not a fast process and a little bit up and down from month to month, but the, over time, certainly that we will see more adjustment down in those retail beef prices. Now, how is that affecting the, the, the price of cattle? Well, you know, cattle prices come down faster, they go up faster as well. Uh, so right now we have cattle prices have dropped significantly more uh, compared to say wholesale beef prices. Wholesale beef prices have, can, have uh, dropped considerably more or, or faster than retail beef prices. So what we see right now is a widening of margins. Retail margins are wider. Retailers are making a little more money right now. Uh, wholesale margins uh, or, or the packer margins, if you will, are also fairly wide right now. And you know, sometimes this is a source of concern to, to producers that the retail prices don't adjust as fast. But the fact of the matter is, first of all, there's lots of reasons why they don't adjust as fast. Um, and, and, you know, retailers have a real uh, incentive not to adjust prices any faster than they have to, and that's really their rule. Uh, when there's enough supply that they're going to benefit more by, by reducing prices to move more beef quicker, then they will do that. But they won't do it until then. And so uh, in the meantime, for a, for a period of time, we will see these wider retail margins. Are are we going to see these especially moving into the, the, the fall and winter months? Well, it will be a continuous process. Uh, beef production is up year over year. It was actually up more in the third quarter. We threw a lot of supply at the beef industry. Uh, and again, we're working through that. Uh, it's, it will be up from here on, on a on a month to month basis, uh, but it won't be up as much here in the next couple of months as it was uh, during the summer. So that's beef. Let's talk about some of the other meats. 
Well, if you look at the other meats from a beef perspective, um, you know, we've got ample supplies of meats. Total meat production is going to be up. It's led by beef, mm -hmm. uh, but pork production is up slightly from last year's level, which was a big level. Uh, poultry production is up, uh, you know, a similar way, uh, kind of typical. Uh, however, in both the cases of pork and poultry, um, we're exporting a significant amount of that increase. So if you look at the per capita supplies or the domestic uh, market impacts, uh, it's less for uh, for them and and it's uh, it's uh, also less for beef now you kind of talked about that a little bit the, the the exports how does the global market look right now well we're, we're seeing progress in all of these from a US perspective um, you know the pork industry had some issues with disease uh, and and uh, you know we're seeing growing exports there which is going to take most of this year's increase in production offshore uh, on the poultry industry we had avian influenza last year we're slowly recovering those markets and so again offsetting increased production to some extent with with uh, with more exports and on the beef as well uh, we're seeing less beef imported and more beef exported this year uh, both of which kind of offset that's the growing domestic production so that the impact on per capita supplies is smaller than that. Well, thank you very much, Daryl. And recently, some cattle industry professionals from Argentina stopped in Oklahoma to talk about cattle production with Dave Laubin. We're, we're out here at the Range Cow Research Center uh, just west of Stillwater today, and we're just showing this group of Argentina ranchers uh, our research operation, Oklahoma State's uh, different research units. Well, in this particular study we were sharing with them, we were just talking about what we've learned in terms of cow feed efficiency because we can measure it and we know exactly what the cows are consuming and exactly what the calves are consuming. Well, I, I think an interesting way to look at it is, you know, here at the Land Grant Institution, we have three primary responsibilities. That's research, teaching, uh, and extension or or visiting with producers out in the state about the things we're doing, uh, especially from a research perspective. And so, so that's what they're doing here today is learning about our research program. Myself as part of our extension group. Uh, you know, that's my job is to disseminate some of the things that we learn and have learned over the years to people that are interested. And, and it doesn't just happen in Oklahoma, it happens in other countries too. Uh, the, the unique thing about this group is they have a tremendous network within their country where they get together uh, on a monthly basis and they share experiences, uh, things to do with production agriculture that have worked for them, things that have not. Uh, and then they take that outside of their country. They don't just stay in their own network. They go to different countries and learn from beef producers there as well. And that's what they're doing on this trip. Uh, so, so they're very good at uh, mining information from each other and from others in, in research and extension throughout the world. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about safety overload devices. Okay, when you're running a rotary cutter on your tractor, you typically need to have some type of, of torque limiter in case you hit something. And really what the safety overload device is, is or, or your uh, torque limiter, is your weakest link in the system. And this is the part that's supposed to slip or fail when you hit something hard. So in, in the ideal world, if you have one of these on here, it'll save your PTO shaft or even your output shaft on, on your tractor or the input shaft on your gearbox. Now, every few months, you probably ought to make sure that your clutch is, is slipping and, and not bound up. So how you'll attempt to do that on this particular clutch, you'll see we have a bolt through here, a uh, spring in between, and then in between here we have a friction disc and some plates on each side. And what you'll do is you'll back these nuts off of here. What I do is I measure these before I begin and then back these off and then kick on the tractor and see if it slips. And you can tell if it slips just by putting a mark across here with a piece of chalk or whatever and see if it slipped. Actually, it would be between this point and here and see if it slips. If it doesn't, then this may be so bound up, you may actually have to pry it apart. 
Now, the other thing that can happen is, yeah, you could put it back to the same one. Well, at least that's a starting point, but you may have taken some friction material off when you've slipped the clutch because of rust, so you may have to add a little bit more tension. You can chalk this again while you're using it and see if it's slipping too much. If you've got a, a rotary cutter, get a manual for it, see what you've got. If it doesn't have one of these on it, you probably ought to think about installing one just to save uh, your tractor and some downtime. So there's some tips on safety overload, on PTO shafts, on shop stop. We'll see you next week. There's been little movement in the markets, and Kim, let's start off with wheat. Where are we at? Well, wheat's uh, just been moving in a sideways pattern for the last couple of months. If you look at that December contract, uh, it's been moving from $3.95 to $4.25. It's getting down close to that $4 level, that getting down close to that support. Uh, if you look at the basis around the state, it oh, runs from anywhere negative $1.29 off that December contract to a negative $1.15. Cash prices are around $2.75, $2.72, 75 They've been dropping off here in uh, the mid part of the week. Uh, if you look at the fund positions, uh, the last report I saw had them uh, short of 127,000 bushels. That's about 635 million bushels that they're short. Uh, since then, uh, they've uh, one day they sold another five, another day they sold another one. So they're they're over a hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollar contract short right now. Uh, there's no sign of the market breaking this uh, this sideways pattern right now. We are getting close to that three ninety five. That does make me nervous, but I don't I don't really see any reason reason to break that. Uh, uh, we do have carry in the market. I think uh, elevators are going to continue to uh, store wheat, you know, once they get it bought. And there's about 17 cents in the market to hold it until March. So that's wheat. Let's talk about some of the crops that are being harvested right now. There's corn. Uh, corn's on the uh, opposite side of that spectrum. Uh, they've been uh, trading in a sideways pattern from uh, on that December contract again on Chicago, uh, 315 to 345. They've been uh, bouncing at that 345, trying to break that, you know, if they can break that, then uh, we've got another 20 cent run in corn prices up to 365. If you look at the fund positions, uh, the last report I saw was 161,000 contracts, over 800 million bushels. After after that report, though, we've uh, they've uh, bought back about 24,000 contracts, so that you know gets them gets them down to that 135 level somewhere in that. But they're still short a lot of contracts. How are things looking in the world of soybeans? Soybeans. Uh, they're trading right in the middle of their mm -hmm. sideways pattern range, you know, uh, uh, $9.35 to $10 is where they are. If they can break that 10, then they've got strong uh, resistance at 10.20. Right now, there's no sign uh, that, that wheat nor soybeans will break these sideways patterns in anytime soon. But you look at the fund positions in soybeans, uh, they're long, 91,000 bushels. Uh, they've been buying and selling a little bit uh, since that report came out, but uh, that 91K uh, is, is pretty close. Okay, thank you much, Kim. And by the way, we have the Rural Economic Conference coming to campus here in a couple weeks. And with more information, here's Demona Doy. Our annual Rural Economic Outlook Conference is coming up October 21st at the OSU Alumni Center here on campus in Stillwater. And so we invite everyone to come learn uh, about what are expected in the way of trends, market outlook, insights into different dimension, dimensions of doing business in agriculture for the coming year. So it's really designed to appeal to people who are in positions of decision making, whether it's in government, whether it's in agribusiness, or whether it's on the farm and ranch. So we have a variety of keynote speakers who will be participating. You can register online. There's a link on the Ag Econ Extension webpage. And so the cost is $50. Please register by October 14th so that we can plan meals and things accordingly. And the price goes up if you don't register prior to the deadline. Oklahoma cow-calf operators that have spring calving operations will be saving back some uh, replacement heifers to put into the herd for future production. 
Those heifers that have already been bred this past spring and are going to calve next spring are ones that we really want to make sure that they're in the proper body condition uh, at calving time next, say, January and February. If the heifers are in good condition going into the fall of the year, we expect them to need to grow at the rate of about one pound per head per day, and that'll keep them on track to be big enough to be in good enough body condition for next spring. Some uh, supplement ideas that uh, you might consider in order to make sure those heifers continue to grow and stay in good body condition are to uh, utilize a high protein supplement uh, in the fall and early parts of winter. Something like two pounds of a 40% crude protein supplement along with uh, good quality standing uh, forage or grass hay, and by that I mean something that's in the neighborhood of six to nine percent crude protein uh, for the forage part of their diet, should suffice to keep them growing until the real serious winter weather sets in. At that time, we may have to adjust that supplement program to uh, something that's a higher energy, lower protein supplement fed in larger amounts. We may be looking at moving that up to four, five, and six pounds of a 20% range cube per head per day in order to keep those heifers going and headed towards our target of being a body condition score six at calving time. If you happen to have some wheat pasture adjacent to the summer pasture, then there's an opportunity to utilize wheat pasture as a supplement for these growing replacement heifers. I would not put those heifers out on wheat full time because they'll gain too much condition, get too fat before calving rolls around. Our experience here at Oklahoma State uh, indicated that pregnant replacement heifers running out on wheat pasture full time gained over three pounds per head per day. And we had some concerns about too much fat buildup in the birth canal. We can use wheat pasture in a more judicious manner putting the heifers on wheat pasture one day and off on the dry pasture for the opposite day uh, so that uh, we're using it as a protein supplement rather than full feed. And when we say putting them out on wheat pasture one day, it really needs to be only about four hours. And that's enough time for them to get a complete meal of the wheat pasture and that's when they'll start to lay down anyway. So we might as well move them back to the, uh, the warm season grass after that, that four hours. Some producers tell me that it's perhaps easier to do it one day on wheat and two days off on the dry pasture, just so the heifers will go out and rustle that dry pasture that second day and not just be standing by the gate waiting to be turned back in to the wheat pasture. If we do it that way, I'd certainly want to monitor their body condition as we go through the winter. And if it looks like we're not making quite as much gain as we'd like to, then we better go back to every other day. We want to get those heifers in a body condition score six, kind of like these, as uh, they're going into the winter in that smooth body condition. They're not obese, and uh, they're not thin. And by having them in that body condition score six category, we've got the best chance for them to calve, have enough colostrum to take good care of that calf right after he's first born, and then still have the capability to recycle and rebreed on time for the following calf crop. Shoot for that body condition score six on these two-year-old heifers by spring, and I think we'll have a successful outcome this year and into the future with those heifers. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. For many years, the first steps some livestock have taken have been right here at the Tulsa State Fair in the birthing center. This is the birthing center at the Tulsa State Fair. It is sponsored by the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, this started in 1998, I believe. I've been on board with it since 1999. Our, our uh, goal here is to educate people about real farm animals, real life, and what really goes into to production of the, of the food and fiber for, for our, our uh, home tables. 
It's a year-round process. We have committee meetings throughout the year, and we start on Wednesday before the fair, and uh, the, the pigs come out, the goats come out, the sheep come out. We get them in crates. Even though we're in Oklahoma, a lot of people don't realize where their meat production comes from. And it does a lot to educate as far as what the animals are, what the veterinarians do to take care of the animals throughout the year, and just in general where their, where their meat products come from. It's really important. It gets the public involved. It shows the importance of livestock and animals. And it gets people, like, a lot of people don't know how animals are born. Like, they don't realize it's kind of the same process in, as in humans. Today we're all students from TCC. I know this weekend we had a lot of students from OSU that are actually going in to be doctors. It, like, I don't get to work with large animals all that often. I'm mostly with small animals, so this rounds out my education and shows me the other side of veterinary, the veterinary medicine. And it's special to see just the look on the kid's face, getting to teach them about everything that goes on in this industry. It's a really big opportunity for us to show what we do. I think it's cool to see all the animals and pet them. And sometimes it's kind of funny to see them. Um, because sometimes over here, like the pigs try to climb on each other. And it's really weird. It's really cool. I like to see all the animals. And I, also, I really like to see the baby ones. They're really cute. We the chickens, they're funny. Because they move around in such different ways. And they just chase around. It's really funny. Well, I do enjoy it. I guess the main reason I continue to do it because the fair has really supported this. Uh, if we need something, they, they make sure they supply it to us. And that's one of the biggest things that keeps us going is the relationship there. And when I say I'm going to quit, Brandy with the fair says, no, you're not. So I'm here another year. Well, that does it for us this week on SunUp. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website at sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From the Tulsa State Fair, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SunUp. <laughs>